um, Larry would will be leading us in an opening word of prayer at this time. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for another day that you've given to us. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we could all come together and learn another portion of your word. Lord, we ask you to be with Gene as he teaches us tonight, help him to remember all that he has studied. And Lord, we ask you to please help us closer to you each and every day. We ask these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Tonight's lesson is uh, in this book, chapter 9, and the title is Overcoming Worry. If anybody's worried about tonight's class, it'll go much better and be a much higher quality if we hear from you. That would help. It would help me, I know. I think it'll make a better class. So feel free to uh, contribute if you have ideas about what we're speaking about at the moment. If you have, um, if something sparks you about a passage that we're reading, we've got a microphone and John wants to run. He's feeling like a rabbit tonight, so, right? You are, right? See? So um, please feel free to raise your hand and, and speak up. That'll be great. Um, overcoming worry is the name of the chapter. If you look at the table of contents, it says something else. It says overcoming worry and pessimism. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38, and I'll read down through verse 42. Martha and Mary. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. Kind of get the scene here. Kind of visualize this as it's happening. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Ah, wouldn't that hit your heart <laughs> if you were poor Martha? But it's true. The worry and the uh, just intensity of getting into the moment and losing track of what's important is so easy to get carried away and yes sir yeah you might say i did <laughs> yeah thank you um i, ha I haven't don't recognize you no. bill it's, pl it's really great having you here tonight thank you and let's hear from more from you if you feel welcome but yep, you know, anybody who prepares for a class, you know that uh, you have to, um, I don't know if you want to call it battle yourself, but uh, it takes a lot of work. So, yep. So Martha, she, she got a little carried away with the moment. And she got so carried away with the moment that she brought that to Jesus. And she must have been under some impression that Jesus would see it her way. Otherwise, she wouldn't have said it, right? <laughs> so she probably was a little surprised. But we learned from that. And we can, I mean, I don't know about we. I don't want to speak for you all. But I know I can feel that way. Jan? I can feel on Martha's side. I, I just, somebody has to do that. <laughs> yes. And I've always... Yes. Appreciated the fact that she was doing it, and you know, I don't know. I hate to say anything too bad about Martha. Right, that's true. And you know, we all benefit from people who serve us, don't we? If, when we go to people's homes, and there's somebody in that home working hard to entertain us and prepare things, 
We just love them for that. And Jesus saw something here that maybe he needed to speak about, though. Maybe there was something different than what we're speaking of here tonight. Um, let's go to, um, oh, yes, Pat. What's always kind of struck me about this is she knew or she believed he was the son of God. She knew he could t turn water to wine, he could heal people, and yet she's telling him what to do. Tell my sister to help me. I think it was her attitude. It wasn't that she was doing the work, or I think it was her attitude of telling Jesus, the son of God, what to do. That's, that helps because um, there must have been something a little different than what we see when people are just loving to serve us and, and uh, entertain us. Elijah. Yeah, so Natalie and I were actually talking about this the other night, and as I was looking, you know, Jesus says, but one thing is necessary. And so I, I think that's a key part of the verse, but the other key part is that she was distracted. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't that what she was doing was wrong, it's a good thing to serve, but in that time, the most important thing was clinging to the words of Jesus, and that seems to usually be the source of anxiety is that we get distracted with other things and we start listening to other voices instead of the voice of Jesus. But Mary was not distracted. She was clinging to the voice of Jesus. Yeah, so there's a distinction that Jesus is trying to highlight here, priorities. There were two things kind of, uh, not battling each other, but there were two different priorities here forgetting that they had the Son of God in their house and serving, or, contrasting to that, taking advantage of the moment, the short three-year ministry of Jesus, the Son of God, being with them. In another context, and I can't bring it up, and the words are not coming to my mind, and maybe if I describe it well enough, you all can figure it out, but there was another passage where Jesus said, I think it's where he's talking about the people that want to go and bury the dead, I think. And Jesus has said, they, you have them with you always, but the Son of Man, you don't. Uh, but it was a kind of a related um, passage on priorities and what's more important. So, but that's another lesson, but uh, it's related. It's more important to dwell on spiritual matters than it is to worry and trifle about things especially if they compete with spiritual matters. Okay, so let's go to Matthew chapter 6. And who wants to start reading there? Let's, uh, we're going to read verses 24 through 34. Does anybody want to pick up that long reading, 10 verses? Brett. Oh. Yeah, Brett. Uh, no. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 24 through the end of the chapter. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore... Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Another uh, hint of the priorities topic there. But there were three times that it was prohibited to worry. Three times, actually prohibited. It's a nice passage, and it doesn't, so, uh, 
It doesn't sound that strong to use that word prohibited when you go through and read it. But if you go through and look again, there's actually Jesus saying, don't, don't, don't. In verse 21, or I mean verse 25, and in verse 31 and verse 34, it actually prohibits worry. Jesus, the same, the same Lord who commands baptism for salvation, also commands not to worry. And we, we put a very high value and a really high priority on baptism. And we preach the gospel and we make it our life's mission to save people with the gospel. And the gospel, the gospel of baptism is, is water baptism is a, a simulation of death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And we know those concepts so well. And we should. And the same Lord who taught us that in God's word also teaches, don't worry. Your heavenly father will take care of you. Yep. In Philippians chapter one, verse six, um, it says, let me read that. Philippians, I get, to, I get the short ones. <laughs> Philippians chapter one, verse six. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So, I th yeah, I don't know. Did I have a, uh, a typo there? I think I might have. It might be 4 6. Yes, thank you. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So that's just kind of an introduction to our thoughts tonight. Um, what I'd like to do is do some, um, some thoughts, some thought uh, discussion questions here. I've got four of them. The first one is, what is the difference? And try to brainstorm this with me. What is the difference between forethought and fear thought? And then between concern and care? But really, let's, uh, let's just uh, talk about forethought and fear thought. My mind on that went to the Old Testament. There's some really good lessons on the children of Israel. Um, you can probably bring some good examples to mind. Bring them up and for discussion, uh, it's, it's great because there is a distinction. When we say don't worry, does that mean we shouldn't plan? Is that worry? How literally are we to take this? And so that's why it's good to kind of figure this out a little more. So forethought, is it okay to have forethought? Is it okay to have fear thought? That's more like worry. What happened in Exodus chapter 25 through 27? Remember the children of Israel in the wilderness? They hadn't built a temple yet. And God is saying, you need a temple. You need a temple to worship me. And in, in Exodus chapter 25, it starts laying out all of the plans and all of the things that they were going to have to collect and everything that everybody's going to have to contribute. There's a lot of forethought there, a lot of planning. Is there anything that contrasts that in the children of Israel's wandering? Cassandra? Yeah, I think the most dramatic example of fear thought for them would be believing the evil report of the 10 spies. Yeah, that's one I had listed too, thank you. Anything else? How are we going to eat the manna, right? Fear thought. They didn't have, they didn't have the faith that they needed, maybe. 
Um, you know, it's hard. I don't want to be hard on them, Brad. Well, it's interesting when you look at the example of the children of Israel, you know, God promised through Abraham that they would inherit a land flowing with milk and honey. Yes. It's painting the picture. And I, I think of um, hiking, not that I'm the avid hiker, Christy is, but um, you think about a picture of a beautiful lake, and it's a beautiful warm day, and you can't wait to see it for the first time this year. It helps you get past all the pain, all the mud that you're hiking through, or what have you. You're not focused and anxious about the current moment because your mind is forethought, focused ahead. Moses was trying to lead the people with forethought, the spies were supposed to have forethought of what they could overcome. Mm -hmm. You use the word faith. They were the faith was to be the forethought of what they and alleviate the anxiety, the fear, the worry in the moment. And I think it's the same with us. We we have the picture of freedom, unshackled from slavery, our homes eternal in front of us. And that's Martha or Mary clinging on the words of Jesus. Not that Things in the moment are there, and we have to deal with them. But it isn't to overcome us with what we have in the future. She valued what was important at that moment. Yeah. There's so much, really, to see in the Old Testament. Uh, look at Noah. Has anybody ever designed and built a massive ship on their own before? <laughs> uh, that's a huge undertaking especially out of wood, especially out of trees, not prefabbed wood. You have to do the whole process. You have to design each member. That's a lot of forethought and planning. That's very, takes an extremely creative mind. Creativeness. Don't confuse it with worry. You know, you can lay awake in bed at night and turn things around about what you're trying to make and oh tomorrow i need to get this and if i drill this this way and if i design you can do a lot of creative juices flowing thinking in your mind and maybe even lose sleep over it but it might not necessarily be worry so there is a distinction god made man in his own image god created the heavens and the earth. That took a lot of creativeness, extremely creative. And when we create things, we are like that. It's enjoyable, it's fulfilling to create things. So that's a little bit of the idea that, yes, you can be forethinking and planning and enjoying your creativeness and not getting into the worry side of life. So what about Esther? That's a beautiful story, isn't it? Uh, let's look at Esther, chapter 4. Esther, chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. Then Esther summoned Hathak from the king's eunuchs, whom the king had appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai, her uncle, to learn what this was and why it was. So Hathak went out to Mordecai to the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had, had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. So Mordecai is learning about this, uh, this conspiracy to destroy the Jews that Haman was orchestrating. And he's uh, about to tell Esther's uh, servant, uh, her eunuch servant, in verse 8. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king to employ his favor and to plead with him for the people. So Mordecai is devising this plan to rescue the Jews from this evil conspiracy that Haman is hatching. And what is he doing? You could mistake it for worry, but he's actually just planning the rescue of the Jews. 
In verses uh, 13 and 14, there's a timeline shift here, but I'm going to read this uh, as if it has continuity and not interrupted. But in verse 13, it says, Then Mordecai told him to reply to Esther, because Esther had come to him, and now he's making a message back. And so this is his return message. Then Mordecai told him to reply to Esther. Well, okay, I think I'll fill in the gap. So uh, he sent a message to Esther, and Esther told him what? What was Esther's reply when she discovered that Mordecai wants her to beseech the king? He didn't call for her to be present. It might look like she was worried, <laughs> right? So I'm trying to make a, a contrast here. It looks like Esther is worried for her life. Not invalid, <laughs> right? I mean, this is a reasonable situation for her to be worried about. I think I might be worried. If I can worry about preparing a lesson, I think I might be able to get a little excited about my life being threatened. So it's not unreasonable. But the importance of her responding correctly is way up there. It's very critical that she not worry and instead have faith because the moment is much more critical than this moment here that I'm standing here. The moment is so critical that it may be the survival or the extinction of the Jewish people. Brad. I like a, a common tool that's used in the scriptures for conquering worry, which is fasting. Fasting? Which is what she's doing. Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you for bringing that out. And uh, her and the maidens fast. Before she goes into the king? Yeah. yeah. And you think, think about Christ. So that must have been further down in this context when she decided, I'm going to do this thing. Okay. All right. Okay, so here's Mordecai then. Let's pick him up in verse 13. Then Mordecai told him to reply to Esther and listen to this message. And it's such a powerful message for us to, to understand. Do not imagine that you, in the king's palace, can escape any more than all the rest of us. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. God will have his way, really, is the message. God will rescue the Jews. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Esther, it may be that you are in the position that you are in because God has placed you there for this moment. Wow, what a powerful message. You know, that's amazing to think about. What about us in our lives? Who knows what we are here for? Certainly we don't have that insight. It's something to ponder. So fear versus foresight, uh, forethought. <laughs> it's an important message. It's, it's important to make that distinction. So that's another example. There's a lot. And we understand the, the idea now. Okay, let's move on. How can worry be like a robber? So let's think about that. Maybe you can throw out some thoughts. Chris. Takes t your time, energy, and um, in, it affects your mental health. And it, it, you know, can, and, and uh, trouble sleeping and all those kind of, a lot of things, those things. Yeah, it can seriously rob you of your health if you let it get away from you. It can cause you to have panic attacks, and those can be extremely debilitating. Kim. So I have 
this is a voluntary job he's got here, okay? Thank you. <laughs> so I have these two quotes. There's a really great book called Calm My Anxious Heart. It's a Christian book. It's wonderful, but um, I keep this quote with me. It says, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And it's so powerful because it really, truly does nothing for tomorrow. <laughs> and kind of what you were talking about, um, you know, if we plan a trip and we get all the plane tickets and everything, we don't sit around and worry every day up into that trip, like, what if our flight gets delayed? What if we get stuck in Minnesota? What if, you know, that's so foolish, right? But yet we do that with our life all the time. You know, we have something laid out, God shows us this, or, you know, we're, we're working his plan, but yet we're just going to fret and fret, and it's not foolish to us when it's some matters, but, you know, if you put it in such a silly thing like a travel plan, um, it seems so foolish, but yet we do that with the other things that are laid out for us. Um, so anyway, but you have to kind of constantly remind ourselves that. Yep. Yep. You make some plans, but you don't fret and fret and fret about it. Elijah. I think it prevents the fruit of the Holy Spirit from bearing, bearing fruit in our lives. When you look at Hebrews 11, uh, in verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And, and thinking also of James 1, uh, counting it all joy when you encounter various trials, um, difficult things happen. And, you know, look at Mordecai. I, I don't think he was happy about the decree that went out, but he had faith, and he believed that God was going to work through it and trusted God in, him, in that. And like in Philippians 4, right before verse 6, it says, let your reasonableness be known to God. And so, in a sense, it's like other people are looking and they're like, why are you not sprouting little white hairs right now? <laughs> and it's because I know that God is going to work through this for his glory, even if it's to my shame. I'm, I'm here to glorify God. And so when my faith is in him, whether difficulty comes or blessing comes, I don't have to worry. I'm trusting in the Lord, knowing that he's going to bring glory through it. And that's just his nature. And I think I referenced this a, a while ago, but it's, it's just been so impactful to me. Um, it, it seems a little weird, but with beavers, we've got a little pond by our house, and this beaver is just annihilating all these trees and they're constantly trying to break up the dams and you know I chuckle because then the next day I'm back there on a walk and they've already filled it back in and it's just their nature and there's nothing as long as that beaver is alive it's going to do it and and that's God's God's nature is to bring good through any situation and we can trust in that and rely on it and so if we don't get distracted like Martha and we continue to put our trust in the Lord, then we can be a part of that. And, but if we get distracted and listen to the worries, then we miss out. Yes. It's interesting you were saying something there that struck me, uh, struck a memory of David when he was grieving for his child who had died. What happened while the child had a chance of surviving? He was in grief, he was in mourning, he was fasting. But what happened the moment that the news came that the child had actually passed away? He put that all away, he went on with his life. Now, that particular topic has nothing to do with this, but get into the mind of David. There's a perspective of here of what matters. When he took view of what matters in life, he reacted one way, to the reality on this side of what was going on before the child passed away. Then on this side, when the child passed away, he took recognition of the new facts of his life without misinterpreting in his mind through a thinking incorrectly, like what worry does, and he behaved differently and appropriately to the new facts. That's perspective. And that's what not worrying and having faith will do for us. It will bring a mind that is mastering the reality of the moments that we're in without 
wasting our time being preoccupied with worry less or Lance yeah I think of the passage that I brought up Matthew 6 27 can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life mm -hmm. yeah um, let's go on to another question let's try to list some of the promises that Jesus gave us that will cure worry. So, uh, well, not actually Jesus, because we're going to go to Isaiah, but God. Let's try, to, let's try to look at some of the promises that God gave us. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. And if, does somebody want to read that for us? See, I give short ones to other people who want to volunteer to read. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Just the one verse? Yes, sir. Okay. You, you keep can him more if you want to. Okay. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Do we all know that song, Peace, Perfect Peace? Isn't that a beautiful song? Peace, Perfect Peace. So we're promised peace. If we trust in God and keep our mind set on him. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6 and look at verses 30 through 33. Who wants to read there? Matthew chapter 6, verses 30 through 33. Mr. Bruins? Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much... Clo more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, in those few verses, there's two promises given. Can we pull them out of there? What was the first promise uh, up in verse 30? Anybody? He'll clothe you. He'll, he'll take care of your, your earthly needs. What is the other promise, the more grand promise at the end of the context? Everything. Your needs will be met. Exactly. Verse 33, mm -hmm. all those things. Yep. Whatever is, not, whatever is not cared for you with <laughs> in the first promise, everything else is taken care of in verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Go ahead. Well, and I don't think you're implying this, but I think you, him saying all these things is summing up the food and clothing, because I think sometimes people think that means cable as well. And, but, uh, fast <laughs> or fast internet. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's interesting, because as an insurance broker, you know, one of the things that uh, I have available to, to clients as disability insurance, but I've thought so much about this passage because the, the idea of, of insurance, what an insurance company would, would tell you and what I'm supposed to say is peace of mind. Get this policy and you'll have peace. But that's in contradiction to the gospel because Jesus has trusted me and I'll give you peace. I think it comes down to the heart of why somebody gets a policy, but um, it, it's interesting to think as a believer that uh, I have a stronger promise than an insurance policy, and I may not be able to maintain my lifestyle, um, but I can devote myself to the kingdom, and I know that when I'm seeking that first, my needs will be met. Yes. 
Okay, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. 2 Peter 3, 13 says, But according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We are promised new heavens and new earth. What is that? Todd. Oh, you're pointing. Sorry, John. Up above. <laughs> yeah. It's talking about heaven. We're yeah. promised heaven. In Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 32, it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he glorified. And then continuing in verse 31 through 32. But then, uh, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for, our, for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So there's a couple more promise in this context. In the first part of it, in verse 28, it says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. And then in verse 32, it says, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? God will care for us. Like we uh, learned on Sunday, one of my new favorite passages in 2 Chronicles. God searches the earth for those whose heart is his, and he supports them. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, it says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is comfortable and my burden is light. And then there's more passages. There's Philippians 4.19, Ephesians 3.20, Psalms 46, verses 1 and 2, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, and I'm sure there's many others about the promises that God has in store for us. We don't need to worry. We don't need to worry. Yes? Um, I'm a creative person, so I like how you mentioned creativity because, oh, thanks. because sometimes I could start to do something creative and I could think, kind of like you're thinking, I could flip it around, I could do this, I could. And there's a point that I have to choose step away and get a different perspective, come back to it, you're going to ruin it. You're kind of taking a gift and you're mucking it up or something. But I think, um, you know, when Jesus says to um, Martha, Mary chose what is best, I, I love that choose because everything is that we have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And not even just make a decision, but as creative people, and God's made us all creative, we have to choose how are we going to foster in that decision. Are we just going to sit there and go, okay, God, I'm going to choose to be happy today. Or are we going to go, God's given me a gift, and I'm going to do something with this joy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show them, or I'm going to express it and take it to another level and let it go deeper. Um, I have found that sometimes getting out of my head and doing something physical works way better for me. Otherwise, I'll stay in my head about things. Um, and that's a God gift again. You know, just kind of helping you think a little differently. Don't just stay on the pages, but take those deeper. Yes, the other uh, evening I, I heard uh, Jim talking about uh, Genesis chapter 6 and Cain 4. Yes, it's Genesis 4. Thank you. Verse 6, somewhere in there, God is talking to Cain, and he's noticing that Cain's having an issue. And the point I want to get at is, 
that God tells Cain he must master it. Sin is crouching at the door. You must master it. People say, be a free thinker. You can look all you want, just don't touch, and all this free thinking stuff. That's not the attitude that God expects of us, is it? God expects us to master ourselves, master our mind. And what you're talking about there, about knowing when to cut it off and knowing when to walk away, this is all about mastering our minds, making the right decisions, keeping things in perspective. Don't let creativity cross the border over into worry and fretting and panic. And Cain didn't listen. No. And in the next verse, he murdered his brother. Yep. And look at the problems it caused for generations mm -hmm. and all the people that it affected. Mm -hmm. They had to leave. They had to go out into the wilderness. I mean, it was just pestilence after pestilence for those people because of that one sin. Yeah, okay, so let's, let's go a little further on this, mastering your mind. What advice did Jesus give his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane? About mastering your mind. Pray. Pray. Why? Keep you from temptation. What did Jesus do? He certainly mastered his mind. He prayed, he meditated, he spoke to God, he went out in the wilderness and communicated with God. And then there's one more thing, it's already been mentioned this evening. He fasted, what? He wept. Yeah. So mastering our mind is part and parcel to controlling worry in our life, uh, Elijah. Well, you know, you mentioning Second Chronicles, that passage about God searching to and fro, I wanted to look at, it's been a bit, so I dusted it off, and I thought it was interesting, you know, King Asa, that the army was coming, and he was anxious, and, you know, what am I going to do? And so he immediately thinks through his carnal mind rather than going to the Lord and seeking help. Um, but it says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this, for from now on you will have wars. And you asked earlier, what, what do we get robbed of? And it's interesting, Asa, in his anxiety, turned to his own resources and abilities rather than turning to the Lord, and it robbed him. Mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Israel having victory mm -hmm. and peace. Yeah. And, you know, you can debate whether God mir miraculously made that happen as a punishment, or it maybe it was just a natural uh, uh, effect of it. Either way, that happens to us today, too. God said, if you're going to trust in that, go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. You lost the God's support. Uh, let's go to uh, Romans chapter 8. Or no, we've already been there, pardon me. Let's go to, back, to, back to Matthew chapter 6. And what we want to do is, we want to go through Matthew chapter 6, and we want to find six affirmations that Jesus gave concerning worry. Some truths, some affirmations. So we're going to go into Matthew chapter 6, and let's see if we can pick up on these six. Uh, affirmations. Uh, starting in verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more than they, much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon, 
in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whither, or wherewither shall, this is King James, or wherewither shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth what ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, six affirmations. One of them is the very first opening statement. What was that? Back in verse, yeah, uh, in verse 24, the very opening phrase, affirmation was, no man can serve two masters. Can't serve two masters. You can either worry or you can spend your, you can uh, put your mind on more positive, productive things. So there's one, verse 26. We get another affirmation there. What's that? Anybody? Yep. Verse 26, there's an affirmation there. Are you not more valuable than they? Right. So... Then in verse 28, the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. In verse 30, there's another one. What is it? Yep. And then uh, verse 32, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows what you need. He knows what you need. That's a very powerful affirmation, a truthful fact. We can put that in our calculus and help us to understand. We don't need to worry about it. And then the last one, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Okay, now, in this same context, oh, Cassandra. Sorry, this passage always reminds me of uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 8, which is a verse I'm trying to memorize, but Paul says, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So worrying about food and clothing, there's several places in the Bible that says don't worry about that, Mm -hmm. and Jesus said it, and Paul said it, and it's just, it's kind of a repeated theme. It's interesting to read the church history in Acts and how they all behaved when the church was just newly established. How did they behave with their property and their money? They exercised that very concept. They evidently thought that food and shelter was adequate. They can help others out and have proper priorities of not worrying. So thank you. That was good. How are you doing on that? (laughs) All right, we'll keep it up. All right, so um, let me see here. What is this next one? Jesus uses the phrase, O ye of little faith, in connection with what four things? So, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, what is he saying there? O ye of little faith. What's that in connection to? O ye of little faith. Connection, it's connected to... um, Anybody? Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. I just wrote down earthly needs, basically. Earthly needs. Uh, In Matthew chapter 8, verse 26... This is probably one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 8, because 
It's a very powerful story about Jesus' power and about the topic of faith and worry. Starting in verse 23, But when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. Does anybody know what the word swamped means? Anybody ever been threatened of being swamped before? Hmm? Isn't it kind of terrifying? I, I don't know. I haven't been that ex- Maybe it makes you feel like Jonah being swallowed <laughs> in a way. I haven't been that extremely swamped, but there's been a couple of times in my life where I was almost, I, I felt like I was being swamped. Both times involved Dave and Deliza Champagne. <laughs> that tells me something right there. <laughs> so one time we were going up for a scuba diving uh, trip on Richard Radke and Charlene Radke's boat. And we were going up the sound and we were going towards Whidbey Island. And it got really late in the day and it was getting dark. And when we finally made it there, we put the anchor down and uh, we thought, well, we've got scuba diving flashlights. We can try the night diving thing. So Richard put on his gear and Dave put on his gear and I put on my gear. Sorry, Jim, you weren't there that time. I know you're a scuba diver. And uh, we decided to go try scuba diving. So we got, all three of us got in the water, and for some reason, Richard's mask disintegrated. I think it had touched some petroleum product or something, so his dive got aborted. But Dave and I, we went down and we went scuba diving in the dark. It was actually pretty fascinating. But there was nothing to do. It was boring. So we came back up. And we got in the boat, but we did not know at that moment that a storm was coming in. And the whole day had transpired now, and we're just eating up daylight, and we're, it's getting later and later and later and later, and darker and darker. And then by the time we get back in the boat, and we get our tanks and our weights off, uh, the storm is really moving in on us. And we're in this little bay where there's boats um, anchored. So we pull our anchor up and we start trying to make our way out. And then we're starting to move out and get, get up to a high speed a little better because we're out of that quiet area. And then the storm is on us. And we're going like this on the waves. And we're going directly against the wind and it's coming at us. And we're trying to pick out the red and green lights way down there at the Everett Marina, probably 10 miles away. And it was kind of scary. That's not nearly as bad as the disciples, I know. Um, the other one is uh, we were at Lake Wenatchee canoeing with Dave and Deliza, and the weather came in on us, and we were in canoes. And I've got a photograph of Dave and Deliza's canoe, and it's up above the waves, and Deliza's there, and it's pretty funny. But anyway, uh, if you get swamped on a boat, you can lose your life. And those two stories don't even come close to that, but the disciples thought they were about to lose their lives. And Jesus is doing what? He is asleep. Boy, doesn't that take some perspective of what reality is? Jesus understood what is what. You know, we alluded to David having good perspective when his child died. And then after he realized his child died, he changed what he was doing and moved on with his life. That takes perspective. But Jesus, wow. How can you be sleeping in a situation like that? He was not worried, but his disciples were. And he said to them, O ye of little faith, 
wow, it seems so reasonable for them to have been worried. It seems reasonable <laughs> to me to be worried about that. But Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith. Uh, then in uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 31, uh, Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith, once again. And I wrote down that it's regarding doubt in Jesus' power. So you can read that context, but that's a, that's a third time that Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith. And then in Matthew chapter 16, verse 8, it's about food. So Jesus said it a few times, but this time that we just read the story of, this is the most moving to me. Uh, no, wait, uh, did he also say it to Peter? There might be a fifth time. John. Uh, that, that's the one that's uh, really moving to me, too, is when Peter tried to walk on water, and he took his eyes off of Jesus. It was really just he was worried about the, the storm and everything around him, and I, I think that's a really good lesson for all of us, too, is that we're going to have trials they're almost inevitable, right? Um, but to keep our eyes on Jesus and keep our faith in Jesus, and that's, the, that's the other one that actually really helped me through a trial with our daughter 10 years ago. And that was my mother-in-law when I was worrying and losing sleep and, and she reread that to me and that really had a peaceful, calming effect on me, just keeping my eyes on Jesus during that trial. Your mom read that to you? My, uh, my, uh, Kyron's mom, yeah, my uh, mother-in-law. Wow. Yeah, it was awesome, and that really helped us uh, both through that trial. She said, don't be like Peter, <laughs> or you'll sink. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. Yes, that, you know, that might be the same context, actually. Is that the same, very same context? Anyway, the, the point is taken that keeping our eyes on Jesus, who has power over creation. Remember, he uh, cursed the fig tree. Remember the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth with his spoken voice. That's some power. God knows what we need. And he has the power to ensure that we get it. So we don't need to worry. Uh, it looks like we're out of time. I have a lot more material. So if you don't mind, next week I'll just tell Brent he doesn't need it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, hey, let's go to God in prayer. Oh, Brett. A general point? Of course, yeah. So we're so fortunate. I've just been sitting here reflecting since Kim spoke. We're, we're so fortunate to live uh, in a time when we have God's holy scriptures right at our fingertips on our phones and available to us in all these places, right? And so many people think, and sometimes maybe even we think, of the scriptures as admonishments and rules and structure and form. But they are full of a life-saving advice how to live your life, how to be a physical health, mental health, family health, you know, success in your life, not prosperity gospel, but, you know, uh, temporal happiness while you serve God. There's so much advice there, and I think about how the world is so full of worry and so full of anxiety, and I think maybe as we evangelize, maybe that's something we consider, you know. It's one thing to say, do you know God loves you and Jesus loves you, which is the most important thing, but also... Do you have these cares and concerns? God has given you tools to escape that. This book can help you with that. And I really think it can be a powerful message for, for folks struggling with a lot of these you know, earthly troubles. So. That's really good, you're right. That, that's very powerful. Um, yeah, it makes me feel like Jesus sleeping in the boat. He had that, he had that reassurance. Yeah, those are, those are good things. Anybody else? Todd. Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, it, it might be just, just like this uh, 
these passages on faith are just random. You know, it's just who needs it. Well, the fact is we all have worry, we all have doubt, and we all need these instructions. I think of Ephesians where Paul talks to husbands and what they need to do, love their wives. He told them that because husbands generally have a problem with that. Same thing with the wife and and what he tells them to do. Uh, God really cares about us, and he knows that we worry, and uh, we, he knows that we have that issue. And, uh, you know, the more you look at all these things, the more you look at how God always constantly took care of people uh, uh, through all these examples, uh, our faith needs to keep getting, you know, stronger and stronger. And we're never going to get there, but we constantly need to be in his word to get, uh, you know, that assurance uh, and that, that peace that you talked about at the very beginning, that's what we need. And we'll get there. And, uh, and then the other thing, too, is, you know, we have the Bible, we have His Word, but we have each other, too. Um, you know, you hear the, the phrase, a, a worry shared is a, is a worry halved, you know, and we got a lot of people here we can, that we can confide in and, and uh, pray with and, and uh, be together and have fellowship. That's why it's so important to, to assemble and to be here. Um, and not just watch a screen, but be here together uh, with the brethren here so we can, uh, you know, share those things. So, yes, anyway. and like the Word of God that Brent was, Brent was pointing out to us, having each other is another thing that God's provided for us. These are things that are given to us. We are a family, and... I think we can let our walls down and realize that we don't have to have maybe so many borders and boundaries and, and uh, you know, love each other and support each other. Uh, that's definitely a Bible principle, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of the Lord. So, Elijah. I just want to say, I just... I feel like it's important of kind of like what's what's being said right now of um, there's such a gift and the anxiety uh, is wrong. It's not trusting and and it means it's something that can be repented of Mm -hmm. that we don't have to hold on to and um, but I think like all of us have talked we all uh, struggle at times with getting distracted and I think you know the encouragement for all of us is you know find someone tonight to talk with if you are anxious about something uh, or to follow up with somebody tomorrow about like this is something I've been anxious with and can you please share God's truth with me and pray with me yes it is a resource that is available waiting so let's go to God in prayer Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the body of Christ that you've blessed us with. The kingdom is a kingdom of people, and Christianity is a movement of relationships. It is about relationships, relationships that we all have with you as our first and foremost important attention. But we have relationships with each other that you expect us to contribute to, each one of us, for the other, but also that you have blessed us with being able to receive from each other also. Help us, Father, not to worry, and help us to seek the tools that you have given to us to help us avoid worrying getting into your word to read the things that you have, that we can understand more about the different aspects of our lives. Help us to count on each other. Increase our faith, Heavenly Father, and help our hearts to be yours. And we pray that you would support us in our lives. Our God in heaven, finally, we have one more thing we'd like to ask. There are so many needs in this congregation for people who have health problems, who have needs for you, and help us as much as we all can to help them, and be with them, Heavenly Father, and heal them if be your will. Go with us now as we finish the remainder of our week, and be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.